Welcome everybody. Today we're going to go over Game of Thrones The Feast for Crows expansion. This expansion actually differs the gameplay most drastically than the than the second expansion Dance with Dragons does. This scenario of the game is four players only and rather than racing towards getting your seventh stronghold or castle this time you're just trying to get point for either publicly known or secret objective cards that you're issued. For example, House Aaron has the public objective to control the Eerie and have more available power tokens than each other house. So that's relatively straightforward and you would enjoy having power tokens. However, you gotta keep this in mind when you're bidding if you're gonna Use your power tokens in order to bid and increase your position on the Iron Throne Or do you want to hold on to them and guarantee yourself another victory point? Some of the secret ones that are dealt out to you and then you decide to keep Could be things like take the black which is to control castle black however since this is more difficult for some families than it is for others all the players get one victory token if they achieve this. However, the Lannisters, which are the most southern family, get two points if they're able to take this. In a similar situation, Arbor Gold, which is controlled to Arbor, is incredibly difficult for the Aarons to get that south and to have that strong of a fleet. So they get four points if they achieve that. While the Baratheons and the Starks get one, and the close by Lannisters only get one, one point. So these cards are dealt out. Depending on how they are, you may want to return them, or if for an easy victory, maybe you go ahead and try them. But if you think you're never going to be able to do it, you just as well return it and hope to get a different card. For this version of the game, it is the Starks, the Aarons, the Baratheons, and the Lannisters. The Greyjoys, Tyrells, and Dornish are not played in this round. And the Tyrell tokens are actually used as the Aaron tokens since you only get cards in this expansion, no additional pieces. For this reason, all the family decks, other than the Aarons, use their base version, and the Aarons are the only ones with a new set of family cards to be issued out. The most powerful numeric value of them is Bronze Yon Royce, in which is his text ability is if you have more available power tokens than your opponent, this card gains one combat strength. So again, this really shows the synergy if you want to have as many available power tokens as you can. Their level 3 is Littlefinger. And if you control the Eerie after this combat, gain twice as many power tokens equal to twice the printed combat value of your opponent's played house card. So if you actually this is not even if you win or lose you still have to control the eerie so this is actually a pretty interesting card win or lose if you still have the eerie you can get quite a number of power tokens based off of the what your opponent plays against you nestor royce is a combat two with two fortifications leon cobroy is two with one sword Icon, Luther Brun is one with a sword and a castle of fortification. Elena Stone, a.k.a. Sansa, is their level one. And if you win this combat and control the Eerie, you may discard two of your available power tokens to force your opponent to discard all of their available power tokens. So this could be particularly interesting if if a bidding is going to be coming up, you can really bankrupt them if you win that combat. And uh, their zero card is Lysa Aaron. And her text ability reads, 
After this combat, if your opponent has more available power tokens than you, gain three power tokens. So this is win or lose, you go ahead and get paid. So if you think you're going to lose your combat, you just as well earn some money from it. So those are the family cards for the for the errands. Like I mentioned before, synergize and try to have as many power tokens as available to you. What's different about the phase one event cards are also unique in this one and they have different readings and for the most part the wildlings are activated almost for each not activated but advanced for almost each one of them and they just have some different text abilities such as ironborn raid each player with at least two ob scored objective cards in his play area is reduced one position on the victory track or burden of power the iron the holder of the iron throne chooses whether a wildling track is reduced to the zero position or everyone musters in strongholds and castles this is actually a very fast-paced version of the game it's not nearly as driven by combat as the base version the game that i played for this was only two and a half hours which if anyone's played the base version of the game, is actually relatively quickly, and that was our first game, so we probably would be even faster for other ones. And what was interesting about this one is rather than knowing how your opponents were going to win and what castles were in their range and which ones they would like to attack next, this version's a little bit more unpredictable. You don't know what your enemies are up to. You don't know if they're trying to take Crack Crawl Point in the Kingswood at the same time, or if they're going to just control more area than any house. These objectives can have wide ranging and hard to predict. So it makes it interesting and dynamic, and I really enjoyed this version of the game. It is a refreshing difference from the base version. So. I would recommend that you give this deck a try. Bye.